Very good Friday morning to you. Welcome to today's webinar presentation, Understanding Estate and Trust Administration, Postmortem Process for Estate and Trust Administration Explained, presented by Elbon Associates Managing Principal and Lead Attorney Stephen Elville. My name, as always, is Jeff Stauffer, Community Relations Director with Elbow & Associates, and I'll be your moderator for today. So welcome to those that are new to our educational webinar series and to our frequent attendees. We always encourage your general questions, so please note them in the questions panel on your screen, and we will pause periodically to address all of them. Your questions always add value and help others learn, so don't be shy in posing your questions at any time. You also receive the presentation slides and two checklists that Steve will be referencing throughout the presentation by email for me early yesterday morning to take notes on them if you wish. These materials are also available in the section marked handouts on your screen to download at this time. We have many professionals on today's presentation as well, so thanks for being here to you. You also are available also have 1.5 continuing education hours available for most of you to um, obtain. So if you'd like to obtain those, if I don't have it already, please send me your ID number so I can submit your CE hours for approval and send out certificates to you as well. Everyone will also receive a post-webinar feedback email right after the presentation. So please take just a couple minutes to fill out this brief survey to offer us your feedback about today's presentation. We always appreciate your thoughts about our webinar series. Here at Elbon Associates, we always want to be a resource to you and give you a path forward for your planning. So if you have any administration needs to address, old documents that may need to be reviewed, or if you haven't started any planning whatsoever, um, we're your place to come to. So consultations are an ideal way to get specific questions answered, have Steve understand your individual situation, and create solutions, and again, a path forward for you. So I'd like to offer Steve and the firm a brief introduction before we get started. So we have a quick poll to understand what you know about estate and trust administration before we get started, and then we will jump into the presentation. So Elville & Associates, founded in 2010 here in Columbia by Steve Elville. We have several different practice areas that we focus on here at the firm on a daily basis, including estate and trust administration, estate and special needs planning, elder law, business law and succession planning, guardianship and litigation, and tax planning and asset protection. We have nine attorneys, 12 staff members, and five locations. Steve and I are coming to you live from the Columbia Gateway Community location today. Our mission, as it always has been and always will be, is to provide practical solutions to our clients' needs through counseling, education, and superior legal technical knowledge. We focus on education a lot here at Elvin Associates in several ways through our planning processes with our clients. We offer many, many webinars and workshops in the communities that we serve each year. And also by way of our client care program, we're one of only a couple firms in Maryland to have an accredited client care program through the Client Care Academy located in Boston. We also work with the ideals of client education, collaboration, and compassion in mind with every client every day here at Elbow & Associates. Just a bit about Steve. His work as an attorney for the past 20 plus years has been centered in elder law, special needs planning, and estate planning, estate planning encompassing estate and trust administration with an emphasis in the areas of tax planning and asset protection. A member of many different national membership organizations, including the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, the Academy of Special Needs Planners, and the National Network of Estate Planning Attorneys, among many, many others. He works to bring peace of mind to clients by creating solutions to their needs through counseling, client education, and the use of leading edge legal technical knowledge. A very seasoned speaker, if you haven't heard Steve present before, offering many webinars, workshops for businesses and their employees, speaking at conferences, and continuing education events each year. Steve was also named to the Maryland Super Lawyers List for an eighth time in 2023 and a seventh consecutive year. He also had a feature story written about him in the National Super Lawyers Magazine about the Elville Center for the Creative Arts, which is our firm's charitable organization he founded in 2014. I'm very privileged to be the executive director of. Steve and I just got back from a nice breakfast with the Columbia Orchestra's executive director, a wonderful meeting we have a wonderful relationship with. If you're not familiar with the Columbia Orchestra, I would encourage you to check them out. They do great work, uh, just like we do at the Elville Center. 
If you'd like to learn more about the Elbow Center, please feel free to reach out to me. I would love to share our story with you when we have just a bit more time. But right now we're gonna focus on a state and trust administration, a topic that um, I'm very familiar with, having just been the um, executor of an estate for a family member. And you're gonna learn a lot, a lot about it here in just a minute. But we'd like, like to learn a little bit about you here in just the next minute or two. And our question for you is, what has been your experience with the state and trust administration thus far? And the choices are, one, I've been the executor of an estate in the past on my own. Second, as an executor, I sought professional guidance throughout. Third, I may be asked to be an executor of an estate in the future. Fourth, I want to keep my planning in order to keep costs down. And fifth, I'm an advisor here to learn to better serve my clients. So again, thank you for being here today. You have a lot of choices where you can be on a Friday after the Orioles won the AL East and their 100th game. If you're still in downtown Baltimore after last night, I don't blame you. I hope you all got back safely. All right, we'll give it another second or two here. I know we have those Nationals fans, Jeff, and Red Sox fans that are a bit disappointed, but uh, wonderful, day, wonderful for our Orioles. Their day has come and it will come again, but now's the Orioles' time to celebrate. And we have more celebrating to do in the future, hopefully. All right, 15% of our attendees say, I have been the executor of an estate in the past on my own. 6% say, as an executor, I sought professional guidance throughout. 17% say, I may be asked to be an executor of an estate in the future. 37% say, I want to keep my planning in order to keep costs down. And 26% say, I'm an advisor here to learn to better serve my clients. So thanks for participating in that. Steve, I'm gonna make you the presenter here. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Jeff, and I'm going to show my screen now and get my slideshow started. And I say good morning to everyone, and I'm here in Columbia, Maryland, wherever you may be. I'm at our conference room number one here in Columbia. I'm looking out on maybe not such a great day, but it is fall, and uh, to my amazement, it's the end of September and almost October. So those of you with kids, those of you who are grandparents, uh, you're getting ready for the, the Halloween season coming up here, and uh, I wish you all the best and, and so much fun with uh, those young people. Uh, where you could be this morning is in so many different places, and we thank you for being here. It's my extreme privilege to be with you this morning and offer some insight on a very broad topic, trust and estate administration, and I welcome our advisor and uh, financial advisor and CPA uh, friends and colleagues to the webinar. Some of you we have not met, and I look forward to meeting you and, and being a resource and hopefully collaborating with you. For those of you who are not professionals on this webinar, welcome. And I know some of you are regular attendees, so hopefully I can give you some insights or substance this morning that you haven't heard before. For those of you who are new, welcome. And uh, again, we have some goals here this morning that I'm going to talk about in just a few minutes. But I want you to uh, realize or remember that Jeff is a great moderator, as you just saw. Jeff will notice if we're having any technical difficulties. He will see if you have a question or you've uh, posed anything in the chat box here. And he's very, very good at stopping me and saying, hey, Steve, we need to take a pause here and answer some questions. So in that sense, this is a very uh, informal uh, uh, webinar. So. We are privileged, I, I wanna welcome you, and, and not only that, but I want to introduce, uh, not, in, not in person this morning, but just let you know that I'm very proud of our team here at Elville & Associates, without whom I could not have done what I have been able to do in, in, in my field, and uh, without people like you who have attended and supported our webinars, financial advisors and others who have supported us and collaborated with us and worked together in clients' best interests, and also I want to say I'm very proud of our administration team led by Shannon Goodwin, 
and also Elizabeth Walsh, who is our lead uh, paralegal in estate and trust administration, and Lisa Betancourt, who is an associate attorney here, and all of the attorneys and associates that support our department that does estate and trust administration. So it is again with thanks and uh, thankfulness that I am here with you this morning. And let's get now into the substance of the presentation. And as we get into the material, of course, this is not meant as legal advice. We are meeting virtually. Uh, we are uh, talking about very high level concepts in a very complex uh, environment of administration. Uh, hopefully I can offer uh, some paths forward as far as making that easier and accomplishing whatever goal that you may have. We're going to talk about that here in a few minutes, but this is not legal advice and we are happy to meet uh, separately and enter into an attorney-client relationship, but this obviously is very high level uh, overview of uh, concepts. And I know some of you come here this morning, those of you who are not advisors, uh, professionals, we know that you are experiencing various um, experiences about and in relation to administration. Some of you, as you had mentioned, about a third of you on this webinar this morning, want to uh, solidify your thought process about administration. You want to think in terms of uh, how do I make that more efficient and how do I think in terms of my own situation with my own estate planning in advance of administration. So we really appreciate your commitment to learning. Uh, those of you who are on this webinar this morning that are, have experienced a loss, those of you who are experiencing a, a situation of grief, and uh, we, we know that many of you are in that situation, uh, we want to try to be a, a resource to make that process easier and to help you get through that difficult time. And hopefully you have an advisory or collaborative team a financial advisor, a CPA, and an attorney that can help you through that difficult time. Uh, while others of you are on the call or the webinar here this morning for your own reasons. So whatever those reasons may be, we're going to make this very interactive. And the goal, again, is like all things, as we here at Elville & Associates teach, that clients should have a goal, they should have a purpose, they should be intentional. And so we will be intentional here this morning, and I will say, my goal in this workshop is to give you a set of tools or set of reference points, maybe new reference points for yourselves, and then to give you a path forward. For example, there are many professionals on this webinar this morning that are available. They're available to assist, uh, and many of them have their own successful practices. So there's a very broad world of help out there, resources, and we want to help to make those connections to give you the tools but also give you a path forward to be helped at a very difficult time or to plan for that very difficult time as approximately a third of you on this webinar are doing. So with all of that said, let's get into the material and we're gonna stop from time to time to be interactive. We're gonna talk about what a state and trust administration actually is, okay? And more specifically, what it might mean to you personally. We're gonna unravel a few mysteries and we're going to talk about what actually happens on the death of a loved one, whether it is a spouse or a non-spouse. We're going to attempt to minimize confusion or give you a set of reference points to minimize confusion and provide maximum support to clients at a time of crisis or maximum support to uh, others if you're not a professional on this webinar. Uh, that sounds pretty non-scientific, and it is. It has to do with empathy. It has to do with understanding and putting yourself in another person's shoes at a time of crisis. We're going to talk about the legal technical. What are the legal technical things to be concerned about? And along those lines, Jeff has provided you with a couple of checklists. We've given you an estate administration checklist. We've also given you a trust administration checklist. And one of the things that will become obvious to you is that some of those steps are similar. Even though these are very different processes, they are similar in some ways. And that's what we hope to do is to demystify that to some degree. We're gonna talk about practical steps, not only the legal technical, but the non-technical. We talked about that a little bit earlier. And we're gonna talk about the most problematic legal and technical tax issues and so forth that we should be aware of and how personal representatives, trustees, financial advisors, CPAs, and attorneys can best work together to support our, our loved ones 
or if we're professionals, support our clients. So we're going to talk about all of those things. Now, before we get started, uh, one of the things that I've been recently doing is using my trusty timer on my cell phone. And I'm going to take about 60 seconds here at the outset, if you don't mind, to just kind of step back for a second. And I would like you to think introspectively. And some of you may, may, may feel like you wish to share some of your thoughts with Jeff by, by the chat feature. Some of you may keep these things uh, you know, truly personal and you certainly do not have to share. But I, I thought we would just take a few seconds here to ask ourselves, how not, not only why are we here, but how familiar are you with, with administration and what are, what are your concerns about it? Let's take about 60 seconds here to just step back. I've hit the timer and ask ourselves, when we think about a state or trust administration, the whole concept of it, what does it mean to you? And you know what? What are your biggest concerns about it? You know, have you had past experiences? Some of you have said yes. Um, what were those experiences like? What are what are those concerns that you have for others who may administer your estate or trust? Uh, what are your general thoughts about this concept? We're going to go for about another thirty seconds. And again, you don't have to share your thoughts, but if you do have anything to share, please do. And Jeff will uh, find a good time to share that with, with all of us, if you're willing to share. Um, again, this is very personal. We, we're going to go about another 10 seconds. And I promise we're going to be efficient today during the discussion. All right, we'll go about another five seconds. Okay, my timer says 60 seconds is up. So just hold that in reserve, whether you're working with a pad of paper, your tablet, whatever it may be, uh, your computer, uh, let's just hold that in reserve and, and, and get, get the introspective start of this, uh, part of this, I should say, going. Okay, so when we look at the mystery of administration, this is one of our client's greatest concerns. You know, we have a client care program here at Elville and Associates, and I think that I could honestly say the thing that our client care members are most concerned about, among other things, is making sure that the administration happens the way they envision and happens in a very efficient way. And that the worry about how that will happen, that transition is one of their greatest concerns. So in probate, the process of probate, the process of proving a will to be valid, we have that probate process. So if someone has a will or no will actually, but has probate assets, then we can have a probate process. Trust administration process, okay, this is a mystery. Why is that different from probate? One of the greatest things we find in trust, uh, trust the world of trust, is one of the greatest uh, mysteries to, to people across the country and around the world, is how does a revocable trust, for example, which is a substitute for a will, how does a revocable trust get administered? Something that the professionals on the call might, might not think that's that, mysterious, but to the average person, this is one of the great mysteries. And the transitionary period, that period of time from the time someone dies, let's say with a trust, to the time of distribution, that transition period, that administrative period, these are the things that we're going to unravel. And among those concerns, of course, if, if those are a people on the call here this morning are married or have children, who will be there for the surviving spouse and children? You know, that's, this is a very, very fundamental concern. What do I do for them? What do I do now? And though I know about a third of you are asking this question this morning. What do I do now to make things easy? Well, here's an answer to that. And it's not an easy answer, but it's a straightforward uh, answer that I want you to, to take home with you today. It should be driven by a process. If we want to make things easier, we want to be driven by process. So I want you to refer to your checklists. Those are not exclusive checklists. There's certainly other checklists available. But if we think in terms of administration as a process and not driven by circumstances, just like anything in life, if we plan, if we are intentional, we can be driven by a process. And your executor or personal representative in an estate administration they should be driven by process, and they would be because the registers of wills, for example, in Maryland, are very process-oriented, even though they all 
sometimes treat the process a little bit differently. The process is pretty much on one train track, going in one direction. But we don't want to be driven by circumstances. And we're going to see some examples this morning where sometimes people are driven by circumstances, but as we look at the next bullet point here, through organization, preparation, education, we can be process oriented and hopefully avoid a crisis that is, you know, unfortunately going to have to be dealt with under circumstances that we don't want to be in. All right, so we're going to look at some case examples here this morning. And in the past, I've been a little bit, um, I guess, overzealous in some of my case examples. And this morning, I thought that I would use these more as just, just truly, truly exemplary of the kind of things that you might be dealing with and not get into the weeds so much on some of these examples, but we certainly can if you have questions. So as we are starting to look at these cases, I'm going to take another 60 seconds here and I want you to step back for just a moment again. And I know I'm kind of forcing you to be more interactive this morning than normal. I appreciate your patience with that. Let's see if we can get some value out of this. I want you to think in the next 60 seconds about if you were to pass away or the loved one or loved ones that you're concerned about were, were put in a situation where there needed to be administration. Who are the people on your team? Like right now, I would like you to be thinking about you know, who are those team members? Do I have an attorney that I could turn to, a resource? Do I have a financial advisory resource? Do I have a CPA for a tax resource, okay? And what other resources might I have and who are those people? Let's take about 60 seconds to do that. I started my timer. I'm going to be beating the drumbeat throughout this presentation of you having a collaborative team. Some of you are very successful individuals on your own and you should applaud yourself for that. You've never used a financial advisory firm Maybe you've never used a law firm, and you may even have relatives who are so high level, uh, into such high level individuals that they're going to administer your entire trust or estate by themselves, and that may be the case. But I want you to be thinking about having a collaborative team if you have not formed one. We're going to go about another 20 seconds. Who are the resources in your life right now? If you had to, if you had to write them down. Who are these resources? And if you have those resources, I really applaud you for that. If you do not have them, we want to help you have those resources. All right, so my trustee timer says 60 seconds is up. Let's now go into the case examples. So I'm going to show you one where I would just describe this as a pretty straightforward, very plan specific kind of estate plan that, that turns into an administration. Then I'm going to show you a couple of examples about assets, certain types of assets in, in, a, in an estate, whether it's a probate estate or a trust administration, and how those assets have to be dealt with. Because one of the things we want to do in administration is we want to have an open mind. I like to describe an uh, administration kind of like a conductor. You're the conductor if you're the fiduciary, and you have various uh, parts of the orchestra or various pieces in front of you, and you're directing that orchestra. And it can be a beautiful thing. If it's driven by process, it can be beautiful, but you have to, and, and actually it can be very enjoyable to do, even if it's under stressful circumstances. But you have to be open-minded to understand the types of red flags that you may encounter. The third example may be a what I might call a need-specific versus an asset-specific situation where the survivor situation is different than what we thought, and we have to be creative. Or there could be maybe a fact-specific problem of, again, we're being driven by circumstances, no plan, poor plan, the fiduciary has to make some judgment calls. So let's get into these examples, not exhaustively, but to give you some background. So here in my example, number one, we have a single person, and we'll call this person Felix, although it could be uh, any name, of course. This, this hypothetical person was never married. And there are people out there, surprising number of folks that just choose never to get married. They die as a single person with no previous spouse. Here we see Felix has one son, and that son, Charles, uh, is now going to be 
the personal representative. And if you go all the way to the bottom of this bullet point list, we see that there is a will and that will leaves everything to Charles. So what do we know here when we see a will involved? We know that by its very nature that this is going to be subject to probate. And some people on the call might say, well, Steve, what is probate? Let's take just a second to describe probate. Probate is a process and Maryland's probate process, like New York and some states that are similar, like North Carolina, to my understanding, these, ro these probate processes are robust. Uh, they are more robust than not versus some of our colleagues in Virginia tell me that the Virginia probate process is less robust and much simpler than Maryland. But, but probate is a process of what? Proving a will to be valid, proving a will to be valid so that the assets can be distributed properly. Everyone is given notice. Everyone uh, has uh, the right to information. Everyone, uh, like a creditor, gets notice. So it's a process. And then once the process is approved by the court, the assets can be distributed. So here we have a residence. We have a checking, savings, and CD situation of cash. That's about $200,000. We have IRAs. We have savings bonds. We see that this person was never, uh, not only never married, but they never made any lifetime gifts, and they have no creditors. So all this is good. So if you're looking at this fact situation, where, where do we kind of raise our eyebrows, if any? Where is anything here that we really need to be concerned about? We've got a son who's going to be the executor. We have a straightforward administration. Well, just two things. I would look at the IRA and I would say to myself, okay, well, this IRA has to be dealt with. So we know that IRAs have to be claimed and that this son, Charles, would have to uh, make the death claim and he would have to get this situated into his own name, assuming that he was the beneficiary of this IRA. Uh, that he would have to get this into his own name by the fall of the year following death. So there's a certain period of time. There's a certain pattern of critical dates. This is how that IRA would have to be dealt with, that by December 31st of the year following death, this IRA would have to be translated into an inherited IRA for the benefit of Charles. So that's the first thing that you as an executor, or in this example, Charles as an executor would want to be aware of, even though that IRA does not go through probate because it is beneficiary designated to Charles, okay? Now, what if there was no beneficiary designation? That would be very unfortunate because it would go through probate. So that IRA could go through probate. Now, what's the other thing that raises a few eyebrows here? Well, um, Felix had quite a bit of savings bonds. So we want to be aware that these savings bonds are IRD, income in respect to a decedent, similar to IRAs in a traditional IRA. Tax is going to be due on these. So now we have to take control of these, these savings bonds. Tax is probably going to be due on them, and we have to figure out how to allocate that income tax. So this is how, what I want you to take away from this first example. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. And I want you to kind of be, be thinking about your own situation, which I'm going to ask you about here in just a few moments. Let's go to the next hypothetical. And this hypothetical fact pattern talks about a different situation. This is a married person. And uh, these names are fictitious, of course. And this couple has three children. Now, if you look at the bottom of this slide, we see that this couple has a revocable trust. And let's take a second for those of you who are not familiar with this. The revocable trust is what? Is it mysterious? No. Is it complicated? No. Generally speaking, no. It is a substitute for a will. So we can have a will or we can have a substitute for a will called a revocable trust or a revocable living trust. So what do we know about a revocable trust? A trust has to have two things that occur. It has to be designed and created, that's number one. And number two, it has to be funded. The assets that are non-retirement assets have to be transferred to that trust. Do IRAs go into that trust? The answer is no. The IRAs stay where they are because that would trigger taxation otherwise. Life insurance generally, especially smaller policies, will stay where they are and they will generally not be owned by a revocable trust. 
So think of the revocable trust in this example as the driving force of the plan, but there are assets outside the trust, such as 401ks and IRAs. So let's just go through this fact pattern. We have a residence, one of the spouses has died, there are three children, they seem to be healthy here in this example. We can assume that this trust was fully funded. This couple did everything that they were supposed to do. Now, what if they didn't? Are there people who have revocable trusts and they don't fund those trusts? Well, of course there are. So there is a backup will to most revocable trusts. So if this couple did not fund their plan, which this couple did, but if they did not, now you as the trustee may also have to be the executor or personal representative, unfortunately, to clean up that non-funding situation. But here we have a properly funded trust. So we have a residence that's going to pass to the survivor who happens to be named Janet. There's cash that's going to be claimed and put over to her side of the trust, so to speak. There's a brokerage count that's going to come over to her. And there is life insurance. So we have to make death claims on the life insurance. I hope you're looking at your checklist here, see, about the first thing that would have to be done, for example, is to obtain date of death values of all of these things. But let's keep going through uh, the assets themselves. Here we see they had a primary residence, let's say, assumingly in Maryland, but they also have a second home down on the lower, slower Delaware shore, let's say. So they have this wonderful home down there, and now that is still uh, titled in the revocable trust because that's a second home. So there's no probate in Delaware, and there's no probate on these assets, which were, in our example, properly titled and, and, and retitled in the name of the revocable trust. Now, there have been no lifetime gifts, and there's no creditors. Can creditors make a claim against a revocable trust? Well, the answer is yes. I have never seen it in my practice, but a creditor could make a claim. And since 2014, um, the Maryland Trust Act allows creditors to make a claim against a revocable trust. And if you are an executor, excuse me, if you are a trustee of a trust, you can run a notice to creditors and you can foreclose the claim of any creditor who does not claim against the trust within six months. So sometimes, even though we think there's no uh, creditors and it would be absurd, let's say, to think there's creditors, sometimes it's just a best practice to run a notice to creditors as is allowed by the law in Maryland to foreclose the claims of creditors. So, so far, nothing mysterious here. Let's go back down to the bottom of this slide. Here we see that there's two scenarios we could talk about. One of them is that Janet, who is the survivor, everything goes to her basically free and outright and free of trust. So in other words, everything just goes to her outright. So what does she do? She continues everything as the surviving spouse in the revocable trust, and you can see that it's outright to her. So here we have the issue of what is our fiduciary duty after the death of a first spouse? Well, we see that the big question that most people have is, what happens to my revocable trust at my death? Well, here upon Jack's death, the first spouse, not much really has to happen. These assets are going to translate over to Janet, whether she has a separate trust from Jack or whether it's a joint trust, meaning an older couple that is using one trust, but it's coming over to her and she's going to continue on with her life. Now, what will Janet do? Well, there's going to be a decision made about the size of her estate and whether the portability election should be made. And remember that that election is allowed now up to five years to make that election, although there's some preliminary things that have to be done within nine months. And if Janet makes the portability election, she will be able to port, in this example, Jack's unused exemption amount, which right now is $12,920,000, it's a huge amount, to port that over to herself, along with the $5 million Maryland exemption amount. So that now, depending on what the exemption would be at her death, she would have 26 million. Jack, or excuse me, uh, she would have that for federal and she would have 10 million for the state amount. So the portability election in this example is one of the things we want to look at. Now notice that Janet uh, could be the surviving spouse, but upon Jack's death, there was a formula clause. 
there was a clause in the trust that said that there had to be the creation of a non-marital trust or the combination non-marital trust and marital trust. So we don't have time to get into that today, but just know that after the death of one spouse, we are dealing with a situation where we're either going to have a rather straightforward disposition to the survivor, or there might be trusts that have to be created that we would call sub-trusts. All right, so this is a situation here where we have a pretty good situation. There's not going to be any probate on the death of the first spouse. Everything was appropriately done. Janet is going to make death claims on the life insurance, death claims on the IRAs or 401ks. And generally speaking, what is she going to do with those? She's going to roll those over to herself, generally speaking. She's a surviving spouse. She has two options for IRAs. She can have an inherited IRA or she can have a rollover IRA. And most of the time, depending on the age here, uh, she's going to have a rollover IRA. Now let's quickly go into the third example. I hope you're following me. Here we have pretty much the same situation, but, but Janet now has died. It's 20 years later. This spousal couple had a revocable trust plan. They are now uh, fulfilling that total plan because Janet has now survived Jack for 20 years and now she has passed away. But look at the changed circumstances here. 20 years later, there's a disabled child. That person, that adult child, uh, prob probably had some kind of a car accident. Uh, does not have to be a car accident to have a brain injury, but this person is brain injured. So what does that mean? They are suffering with a disability, and we may need to be worried about distributing assets to that person. But let's go down the list of assets. Here we see that there is a retirement plan community, excuse me, a retirement community, a continuing care community, I meant to say, where Janet is living. So she is now not living at home. She's living in a CCRC, and she's made a deposit there. Uh, so we hope that that deposit was beneficiary designated or properly designated to what? The revocable trust. Hopefully Janet was diligent when she did that. She's got some significant cash. She's got IRAs that she's leaving to the children. We still have three children living. One of them is disabled now. She has a brokerage account that has grown quite a bit. She has a little bit of life insurance, but look what happened over the years. She ditched the Delaware property for some reason, and she bought a house in Florida. So that Florida house, let's assume that is in her revocable trust too, and it is not part of probate, although it would be part of probate if it wasn't in the trust. She still never made any lifetime gifts, and her estate plan, as you see in the bottom, at the bottom, as a survivor, she is basically saying, I am leaving this in equal shares to my kids. And look how she did it. She left those shares in further trust. So as you as a fiduciary, as a trustee, or your fiduciary as a successor trustee is now going to be dealing with this. And at the death of the second spouse, this is where the bigger administration is going to occur. So you're going to be dealing with hopefully depending on the contract, getting that deposit back from that CCRC after they've re-rented that unit, such as the process would be at Charlestown or um, any kind of Riderwood facility that we know about, um, an Erickson facility here in Maryland. There would be a taking charge of that 375, which hopefully is in a trust account and it's not in probate. A death claim, death claims would have to be made on the IRA by the children. And where are those IRA death claims going? They are going to the further trust that are going to be established for those children. Why? Well, those trusts were probably established. We are just thinking about that here. We don't know for sure. They're probably established for asset protection, marital protection, divorce protection. So we're going to fund those trusts now. Those trusts have to have EIN numbers. So we're talking at a very high level here, but just giving you a feel of your fiduciary responsibility or the responsibility of your fiduciary to make sure those, those death claims are made, to deal with the brokerage account, get date of death values, okay? Um, deal with the life insurance, deal with the sale of the Florida house or maybe the distribution of the Florida house. But what do we really see here that's a problem? All of this is fairly routine, but we have a disabled child. So we may have to look deep into the trust and say, is it part of our fiduciary duty to do the highest and best thing for the beneficiaries? 
Well, absolutely, yes, it is. So if the trust allows for the establishment of a supplemental needs trust as a standby measure, perhaps that is what the decision should be to fund that supplemental needs trust instead of a general needs trust where the assets will no longer be available resources for public benefit purposes. If this disabled child is having brain injury therapy that's costing $25,000 a month, whatever that situation may be, the fiduciary is going to act in the highest best interest of that person and in the intention, with the intention of Janet, who is the deceased person. Now, what if there is no provision in that trust, which we strongly recommend that there would be a backup provision like that? What if the trustee was forced to establish a general needs trust for health, education, maintenance, and support of that disabled child? Well, what do we know? Well, that money is an available resource if that disabled child is on public benefits or needs those public benefits. So now we may have to decant. We may have to change that trust to a supplemental needs trust. And Maryland has just passed a decanting law. And last Wednesday night, a week ago, uh, I was privileged to be able to sit with the estates and trusts and elder law sections to hear a wonderful attorney uh, discuss the new decanting law. So Virginia and Delaware and many other states have had decanting for quite some time, but you as the fiduciary would need to know that Maryland does have this decanting law and through your resources, you would be able to fix that situation where this trust, is, which is not going to be the highest and best thing for that disabled person, would now be able to be changed to a supplemental needs trust. So part of this administration is uh, making sure that everything is done properly and that uh, you've accounted for everything using that process that I keep talking about. Now, in the interest of time, oh, hi, Jeff. Steve, hi there. Can we uh, pause for a couple questions related to your fact patterns? I'll take a sip of water. Okay. First question is, if you have a situation where the liquid assets have transferred via operation of law, i.e. TOD, and say you have a home in the estate but no real liquid in the estate, who pays for the upkeep of the house until the house is sold, i.e. insurance, property taxes, et cetera? Thank you for that wonderful question. I think that is a good example of how TOD can be not be our friend, I should say. So what has to happen there, I think, is a common sense situation where uh, the beneficiaries have to maybe contribute money back to the trust or estate because there's nothing there to, to deal with the costs of administration. So to me, what has to happen there is, is, is uh, intelligent people have to agree monies would be contributed, which is kind of counterintuitive, monies would be contributed back to the estate or trust by the beneficiaries themselves who have received this TOD, hopefully it's the same person or persons, and now we have money to deal with the trust or estate until such time as it is distributed because obviously the fiduciary duty of the, of the trustee or executor is to maintain that house, pay the taxes, until such time as it can be dealt with properly. So I think that that's what has to happen and many times does have to happen. Okay, that is the exact thing that happened in my relative's estate that I was the PR for personal representative for, exact to the letter. So thank you for that. Next question is, should executors of small estates that are well below the lifetime exemption amount consider making the portability election? Wonderful question. Thank you. I think that's going to be situational. And I'm going to say uh, as a general rule of thumb, and this is not uh, scientific at all, and it's all fact specific, that generally speaking, I would err on the side of making the election. And the reason I say that is when the first person dies, let's say that first spouse to die dies, we know what the exemption amount is. We know we have portability and we know we have uh, treasury regulations that say once that ported amount is, 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 is opted for, that it cannot be taken away. The government cannot claw that away. But what we don't know is what the, uh, the exemption amount or amounts are going to be for the survivor. We don't know how long the survivor is going to live. We don't know what the politics are going to be in the future. Uh, we don't know if the 2026 sunset provision is going to occur where the exemptions are going to be cut in half we just don't know. So I would err on the side of choosing portability, generally speaking, 
in, uh, unless it's very clear cut that it's never going to be needed and the person does not want to spend the extra money to make the election in the form 706 and the form MET1 that have to be uh, generated. Okay, thank you. And one more uh, brief question. Do you get an EIN number before or after death? That's a great question. You're going to get an EIN number, generally speaking, for fu fundamental planning like wills or revocable trusts. You're going to get that after someone dies and there is an administrative estate that has to have an EIN number or there is a trust being established that has to have an EIN number. And generally speaking, that's after death unless there is an irrevocable trust being created during life. Okay, thank you, Steve. Thank you, Jeff, for interrupting. And now we have the last fact pattern, then we're going to get to the checklists and other concerns in the interest of time. So this one is our being driven by circumstances example. Here we have a person who was separated. He was not divorced. There are many people out there like that. Uh, the spouse is in, a, in an alternate lifestyle kind of situation. One of the children, uh, there's two children. One of them is having issues financially that are rather serious and this person passes away. So here we have no will. And as we look down at the bottom there, we see there's no estate plan. So the question here to ask ourselves, is there or are there uh, probate assets? And the answer is going to be yes. Let's take a look at the first example. Checking and savings, $3,100. There's, no there's no indication that this person had a POD, payable on death beneficiary. There's no indication there was a joint owner, so that $3,100 is in probate. The inherited IRA that this person had, we assume he made a further beneficiary designation. So that's probably not in probate, but if he had no beneficiary designation, that would be in probate. The automobile is in probate. It, there's no indication there was a joint owner. Life insurance, unfortunately, is in probate. Why? Because it has no beneficiary. So that's an example of that. Savings bonds, the 177,000 of savings bonds, is that in probate? Well, if these were just owned in his own name with no beneficiary, no joint owner, we know that goes through probate. So that's a probate asset. Now look at this, this person in better times, in, in the more, uh, I guess, uh, healthier times for him, he made a large lifetime gift. As a trustee, as a fiduciary, do you need to be concerned about that? Well. What is the gift tax exemption right now? $12,920,000. This person made a $500,000 gift, which deducts from the $12,920,000, and that is after the $17,000 annual exclusion amount, or whatever that annual exclusion amount was during the time this person gave the gift. So generally speaking, we do not have to worry about this. And what, what about Maryland? Do we have to worry about this for Maryland? And the answer is no, because Maryland has no gift tax. So we do have to worry about it for federal uh, gift and estate tax purposes, but not for Maryland. But even for federal purposes, this is not going to be a problem. Now, just as an interesting fact for some of you who really love to get into the, the weeds, uh, when this man gave this $500,000 gift, and he was not worried about gift tax because he had a very large exemption of whatever amount at that time that he did it, does, does he have absolutely no worries at all? Well, the answer is no. He does have to be worried about capital gain. What if he gave away assets that have a low basis like stock or he gave away a piece of real estate with a low basis when he transfers that to the new uh, donee uh, by way of the gift, that donee, if and when they ever sell that property, they will incur capital gain. But if this was cash, then he has no concern about that whatsoever. So even though people may make gifts and those gifts are exempt or below the exemption amounts and don't trigger tax, we still have to worry about income tax. So this is an example of the executor having to be driven by circumstances. And we know there's a surviving spouse. So when we see all of these things going through probate, they're going to be going to what? to the beneficiaries by the laws of intestacy, the laws of the state of Maryland as to where those assets are flowing and the intestacy laws have changed just a little bit with the new legislative session last, uh, last spring and now as of October 1st, those, um, those 
intestate errors are still the same largely, but there's a little bit of tweaking about how much the surviving spouse gets and so forth. So here, this person, their estate plan is going to flow in ways that maybe they wanted, maybe they didn't want, but obviously they didn't care too much and they weren't on top of their situation. Last thing, we have one child in bankruptcy. If you're the executor here, can you be concerned about that? Well, yes, you are concerned about that, but can you do anything about that? Probably not, unless this child is disabled. Because why? There's no will, there's no pattern, there's no document that's controlling these things, and the distribution is going to go to this child who is in bankruptcy regardless of their situation, and unfortunately that might be lost or maybe would be lost to the claims of bankruptcy creditors of that child. So these are all the things that we're dealing with, and uh, I'm going to now move on in the interest of time. Now, I know I've done quite a bit of talking over the last uh, several minutes, and then we had some questions. Let's take 60 seconds, and I want you now, after looking at those examples, I want you to think about your own situation. And if you're a professional on this webinar this morning, think about a client of yours or your own particular situation uh, personally, and ask yourself, what does my situation look like compared to this? If I passed away tomorrow and I, I either took on, uh, excuse me, I'm, I'm asking someone else to take on my fiduciary, the a fiduciary role to administer my estate, what does it look like for them? I'm going to hit the timer so that we can be efficient and end on time. Ask ourselves this question, what, what does our situation look like when we look at these various uh, examples? These are just four of hundreds of examples we could go through. Do I have a probate or non-probate estate right now? How do I have my assets titled? How do I have my assets titled in relation to my own estate plan? Uh, one of our listeners this morning, one of our attendees has said a TOD could pass to a survivor and bypass the whole estate plan. And so what do we do with the estate plan? How do we fund that? You know, what does that look like for us? So we have about 10 more seconds. Let's just ask ourselves these questions rhetorically. All right. So we have about two, one all right, so hopefully that was a little bit thought-provoking after the mind-numbing uh, 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 examples that I gave. Now, let's talk about some non-technical things. How can we minimize confusion and provide support to clients, loved ones uh, at, at a time of crisis? Well, we want to have empathy. I talked about that. And it's not only a personal thing, but it, I think it's a fiduciary duty. I think it's a fiduciary duty to be empathetic, okay? We need to ask ourselves, what kind of family support does this person have right now? And what can I do uh, as, as an additional thing, as an additional part of my fiduciary or professional duty to support this person? If you're a professional, how can our whole firm have this mindset of empathy and support? We can be creative and we, we need to be informed about our resources. So earlier, no matter who you are on this webinar, I had asked you to kind of consider your resources. That's one of the biggest thing I think you can do is to know where your resources are, but maybe even more importantly, know that, that your fiduciaries have an idea where the resources are. And this is only going to happen through a collaboration not only of your team, but of your fiduciaries and your team together. Um, we want to uh, be able to act as counselors and coordinators. Even if you're not a professional in this webinar and you're in a fiduciary role, remember you're in that position of leadership and people are going to be looking to you at a time of crisis. All right, I'm going to move on now. So we want to assure survivors that they need to take care of themselves Generally speaking, and I'm going to put an asterisk here, as you see, there is no hurry in most circumstances. Yes, there are, there are circumstances where we need to act quickly. There could be rental real estate and the pipes have burst. There are tenants and those kinds of things. But generally speaking, we want to be methodical, have the survivors take care of themselves, and in good time, meaning in the next three weeks or so, start the process of addressing the estate and trust administration. 
We need to assure people that the fiduciaries or advisors are working together. We need to give them that assurance. We want to assure them in advance that everything is in order or even after a crisis that things are being assembled into order. Help them with final arrangements. Work with any family related issues. Are there families that are not cohesive? Yes, we want to do everything we can in the fiduciary and professional role to make sure we're sending messages of sympathy that we're bringing people together at a time of crisis. We know that where there have been broken relationships and hurt feelings, that funerals, memorial services, and those kinds of things can be very painful. And we want to do the very best we can to minimize pain. So let's look at now, having looked a little bit at the non-technical process, let's look at the step-by-step -step process that generally needs to be taken at depth. Probate versus non-probate, we've largely talked about that already, and hopefully you've picked up on that. What happens if there's a will or no will? What happens if there's a trust plan, and hopefully that trust plan is funded? And if that trust plan is not funded, then it's going to have probate aspects to it. These are similar steps, but they're different. Uh, use the checklist, critical dates. Again, we're being redundant intentionally. Organization and process are the key. The legal process basically is this. Of course, this is a very broad subject. I'm simplifying it as much as I possibly can. Date of death, death certificates are issued. So in a non-COVID world or a post-COVID world, hopefully this happens fairly quickly depending on the circumstances of death. Letters of administration in probate are, are administered or issued, I should say. So what is this? This is the official letter, the official raised seal that gives the executor, the personal representative, the power to what? Take control of the assets. And as they used to say when I was a young lawyer, marshal the assets of the estate. An inventory and information report is due within three months. Now, this is going to depend on whether or not there is an, a, an alternative uh, expedited method of administration, but this is a typical example of a traditional, regular estate administration in Maryland. So we have an information report, an inventory that's due. We have valuation dates and alternate valuation dates. Claims against the estate by creditors are typically made by law, by the code, within six months of the date of death. However, certain registers of wills treat this differently. And this is a mystery to us on this side of the legal world, but some registers of wills treat this as if the date of uh, the claims against the estate can run from the date the estate is open, not the date of death. So by law, it is the date of death. Um, spousal elected, elective share. So there are there is a spousal elective share claim period Maryland has a new spousal elective share law, and that is way beyond the scope of this discussion. So where a first spouse to die does not leave everything to the survivor, the survivor under certain circumstances has the right to elect to receive at least the statutory share, and this share is a greatly expanded share compared to what it used to be. So this is why the executor or personal representative wants to have their resources available to make sure they are on the straight and narrow path. Now, whether you are uh, a person who's acting in this role or someone else is going to act in this role for you, or you're a, an advisor that is helping to support such a person, what is the greatest problem or the greatest fear in my mind that any executor or personal representative or even trustee would have? Well, in my mind, it's the, the possibility of being removed. It's the possibility of not carrying out your fiduciary duty or that person's fiduciary duty and actually being removed as an executor. And that could be a very painful, very hurtful situation. So we wanna make sure that we're following the process that you've got your resources and therefore you're, there's no possibility that anyone who is disgruntled or anyone who could, could shoot arrows at you, so to speak, to try to have you removed for a breach of fiduciary duty. That's why these checklists and these processes are so important. Normally, there is a nine month period for disclaimers. There are disclaimers that could be made for personal reasons or for tax reasons. They're not everyday occurrences, although they, they can be. Uh, federal estate tax returns and state estate tax returns are due within a certain period of time. 
we're going to keep going here. The Q-tip election, which is the marital trust election, must be done within a certain period of time. The maximum time is 15 months. The portability election with a certain notice period in the first nine months is up to 60 months to make that election. The first administration account is due. Second administration accounts are due. Uh, a personal representative is re released from liability when they uh, get the accounting approved. So these things are very important. Retirement plan assets have to be claimed within a certain period of time. This, this is what I mentioned earlier about the timeline for retirement assets. So this is where it's a bit, it's a bit uh, befuddling because retirement plan assets properly left to beneficiaries are not part of probate. And yet we would almost think that the personal representative has a fiduciary duty to make sure the beneficiaries are getting those assets in, in order and, and claiming them. And where there's inheritance tax due, where it might be going to a non-lineal descendant, we want to make sure that that inheritance tax is accounted for because the personal representative could be held liable for that. And of course, the SECURE Act has changed the way we think about how long people can stretch out their retirement assets. So we have to be at least a little bit educated and, and cognizant of the SECURE Act. There is a fiscal year end. Uncle Sam wants to know from the date of death until the time of distribution, who is paying the income tax? So there is going to be a 1041 and a fiduciary tax return that's going to have to be dealt with, a form 504 for the state of Maryland to make sure that Uncle Sam gets this reporting, who is going to pay the tax on the income and dividends in the estate, or let's say that an IRA got a uh, beneficiary uh, was never listed, and now that IRA is part of the probate estate, that is going to increase the income of the estate. All of this has to be accounted for on the Form 1041. Where there are big estate tax issues or income tax issues, we're going to want a closing letter from the IRS. And these are all process-driven uh, issues that, that protect the personal representative. Now, let's look at this checklist side by side and look at the non-probate process. This is the process where assets have passed by non-probate. Let's just use an example of the revocable living trust example. It was fully funded. There was nothing going through probate in the trust because it was fully funded. There's nothing going through probate in the non-trust assets, IRAs and so forth. So we have the same situation, but a little bit different but this should give you comfort if you're trying to learn this process. So date of death values have to be obtained. Uh, of course, there would be a, a death certificate, which I didn't include here. Beneficiaries have to be notified under the Maryland Trust Act of 2014. Qualified beneficiaries have to be notified. So there is a notice requirement. You'll notice that in uh, probate, beneficiaries are notified because it's by law. So now, you have a responsibility as a fiduciary to notify beneficiaries. You're going to make that decision whether to notify creditors to try to foreclose claims. You're going to look at the same types of issues, the spousal elective share, the alternative valuation dates, the Q-tip election, the portability election. You see, does this sound familiar? This is the similar process, but it's not jumping through the same hoops as the registers of wills process. Retirement accounts have to be dealt with on time. The SECURE Act issues have to be dealt with. Uh, all of these things have to be dealt with in a similar way, but we're dealing with non-probate. Now, look at this next bullet point. If you're a fiduciary, your refunding agreement, your waiver agreement, your release agreement with the beneficiaries should be signed. You have a right to be released from liability. You have done your job or your fiduciary does. You have done your job, you have been accountable, and now at the end of the administration, when everyone has transparency, they have accountability for everything, there's been an accounting, now you have the right to be released from liability, to expect them to sign off prior to you making that distribution that they realize that you have fulfilled your duty. So you want to make sure that you do that, and in my opinion, you do not want to distribute assets to beneficiaries who could sue you if you have not yet gotten that release. The same 
fiduciary accounting forms and, and tax returns are due, Uncle Sam again wants to know from the date of from the date of death until the time of distribution that the assets are being accounted for for tax purposes. And again, the same issues with the closing letters with the IRS and so forth have to be dealt with. So now we've kind of gone back and forth a little bit. We've talked about the non-technical things and then we got into the checklist of technical things. Let's go back to practical steps. So again, just to reiterate, we need to have a, have a meeting. You should be telling your fiduciaries or you, you yourself as a fiduciary should be addressing these concerns within the first 30 days after the death of someone, especially on the death of a, survive, of a spouse. Coordinate with other advisors. Uh, coordinate and attend meetings with the advisory team. Use the checklist. Organization is the key. Hopefully I'm driving that home today. Have an inclusive process. We don't want to have a process where people are excluded. Now, there are troublesome beneficiaries. There are people where families have not gotten along. There are people that cause difficulties. This is going to be a case-by-case -case situation about how much information to share. However, the Maryland Trust Act, for example, says that all information has to be shared and that pretty much means everything. So we can't be selective. If someone requests information, generally speaking, they are entitled to it. This is an inclusive process. Again, every circumstance is different, and we could talk about this offline for those of you who have issues about this. We want to make sure that people are coping, that they have resources, that they are encouraged, but not hurried. And of course, surviving spouses many times want to do their own estate planning, and Perhaps you have seen this where surviving spouses are running and they're exhausting themselves to get their own estate planning done in the time of grief and crisis. And we always want to be very careful with that. Yes, it's a good thing to reset and think about estate planning after someone has died, especially at that time when everything, everyone is so aware of the possibility of death. But sometimes surviving spouses can make themselves very unhappy in forcing themselves to do this before it is the time is right. So we wanna be very, very careful there. Again, organization and general readiness, we cannot emphasize this enough. Document storage during life, having assets that are, uh, uh, information I should say, and assets that are readily available. Uh, having an estate plan for yourself or for your loved ones that is organized and, and the information is available and there are spreadsheets of assets stock certificates are um, in a place where they can be um, accessed bonds if there's a if there are original bonds or information about bonds at treasury direct all these things need to be where people can get them uh, ever plans and other electronic archives are available but the question is whether or not those are practical for you or your loved ones given the state of the world we're living in and having everything electronic where all that information is online, that's a personal uh, choice and, and a planning decision. So what are the most significant and potentially problematic issues? I know we're winding down here toward the end of the presentation and I appreciate your presence. Most of you are still on the line here and I appreciate your, your uh, involvement. So we wanna review titling prior to death. That's just what I was saying a moment ago. We wanna have our own planning and those of our loved ones as rock solid as possible making sure that we have assets aligned. Even for someone who has a will, they still, have to, they still have to align assets. A good example of that is we have a will, but we have a lot of retirement assets. So we wanna make sure those beneficiary designations are flowing properly. Where we have a revocable trust, we wanna make sure the non-retirement assets are funded and that the retirement type assets and life insurance are properly flowing. Business interests such as LLCs, they need to be properly aligned with the trust. And uh, that's a different subject, but those business assets, which many people have, they can be hanging out here in probate. And if that's not the intention, we need to be aware of, we need to deal with that. Uh, valuation of all assets after death, this is very important. Uh, accounting for all assets right after death is very important. Caution in retitling accounts and the acceptance of life insurance proceeds after death. Sometimes our financial advisor colleagues in doing a high and best uh, job for their clients, and sometimes clients 
are rushing to retitle assets after the death of a spouse. And that's a natural thing to do, but we want to urge caution that we don't want to retitle too soon because the, the estate plan of the deceased spouse might say differently. It might say that assets have to go a certain way or be held in a spousal trust, but if we retitle assets in the name of a surviving spouse very quickly, we may be con controverting the terms and provisions of the trust or will of the deceased spouse. From an acceptance of assets point of view, we don't have too many concerns about that right now because the exemption amounts are very high, but in a circumstance where the exemptions are lower, we might have a surviving spouse that accepts assets too soon, and now they cannot disclaim those assets for estate tax purposes. We want to deal with inheritance tax. Maryland exempts most people from inheritance tax, lineal descendants and so forth, but non-lineal descendants, very generally, are subject to a 10% inheritance tax. We want to make sure that post-mortem elections are addressed. Again, I'm repeating myself, the portability election, the Q-tip election. We want to make sure that uh, if we don't do that, see, we are, we are breaching our fiduciary duty or opening ourselves up to liability or missing the ability to use exemption amounts. Look at this last one, failure to foreclose creditor claims. Yes, it is a pain to have to spend three, four, five hundred dollars giving notice to creditors when we know there's probably no creditors. But on the other hand, if you're a fiduciary, what is your highest and best obligation? And that is to foreclose the claims of creditors as much as possible from a fiduciary standpoint, even though we probably know that there's not going to be any creditors in most cases. So these are things that are highest and best practices that we need to be aware of and advisors need to be aware of. So as we start to wrap up, how can financial advisors, CPAs, attorneys, personal representatives, trustees, fiduciaries, and individuals of all kinds, how can they best collaborate or help people in need? Well, we want to communicate completely. If we have a team, we want that team to talk among themselves. Many people have a collaborative advisor team, but that team does not necessarily talk among itself. We want to make sure that happens. We want to determine what advisors or what resources are going to be the quarterback of this team. Sometimes that works better than others, but the client or the person who is relying on these advisors, that person deserves to know who is really driving that ship. And I believe the family of the person and, um, and all of the advisors should be in communication, even to the extent of having a Zoom or in-person meeting with all the advisors present, not only during life, but certainly at the time of crisis. Uh, of course, we just talked about this, investing significant time during someone's lifetime to make sure that all assets are aligned, including proper beneficiary designations, so that we are not driven by circumstances, so that assets that could avoid probate are not subject to probate, if that's a goal, and maybe most importantly, assets that are not subject to tax, like an inherited IRA that could be stretched out for some period of time, even under the SECURE Act, that it would not be subject to tax immediately, basically, because of poor planning. In a situation where illness is obvious, and many of us are dealing and seeing those kinds of situations, expedite meetings, expedite coordination between advisors, expedite coordination between fiduciaries. That is an indication of things to come, unfortunately, where someone is dealing with an illness. We need to get that done sooner than later if there's still a chance to get things organized and aligned prior to someone's death. And we want to ascertain people's intentions. So let's say that you're a person on this webinar and you want to do the highest and best thing you can to make sure that your intentions are carried out. I would encourage you to use a memorandum of intent or a letter of wishes. Jeff and I are uh, very happy, Elville and Associates is very happy to make a simple letter of wishes available to you. This can be something that articulates your simple ideas of what you want people to know about the administration or the future uh, of the beneficiaries and the money that you're leaving to them. Or it could be more complex about your goals, your values, your the things that you feel and want to pass on along, the thoughts and ideas. Uh, these, this is a wonderful tool that is not a part of most estate plans that we want to encourage you to use, a letter of wishes. We want to encourage, again, repeating myself, advanced organizational tools during life. 
the education of family members, a systematic organized system during life, a systematic organized system after death, and to assure our loved ones, our fiduciaries, if we're advisors, and to ensure the entire team that everything is in order and will work in one accord for the benefit of the people that are most in need at a time of crisis. So in the interest of time, I'm going to start closing now with uh, this, the presentation. I'm going to ask you to think about any questions that you might have. Uh, one of those questions, which I will not time you on right now, is just to ask you, what are your resources again? What is your situation? What is the situation you're concerned about? And what might you have taken away today that might be some substance that you can walk away with that gives you a tool that you can uh, maybe further think about? What are your goals? And, uh, you know, basically, what are my resources and, uh, and or the resources for someone I love? If you haven't met with us, we look forward to meeting with you and, and consulting with you, whatever that may be. Uh, we like to do uh, meetings here at our uh, high-tech conference rooms here at Elville & Associates, or we can do them by Zoom or Microsoft Teams virtual meetings. If you haven't done estate planning, well, certainly we would love to talk to you about that and being a resource to you. But this is about administration. So you may have existing estate plans that need to be reviewed and you may have specific questions about how those plans are going to be administered and what you can do to sure up any weaknesses in their plan. So there's nothing to fear if you come talk to us and you have not been a past client of Elville and Associates, uh, there is nothing to fear because there is an attorney-client relationship even if you just come as a consultation. So we generally do not charge for these types of consultations. We, would, we do not generally charge to review documents uh, to do a cursory first review, we do not charge for that. And we want to help you have an advisory team. We want to answer your questions. We encourage you to come with questions wherever you and whenever you may come to talk to us. And again, back to the advisory team, we want to help you form that team. And if you already have a team, we want to meet that team and be a part of it. And most importantly, we want to give you the time to think, the time to decide what is the goal what are the weaknesses you want to sure up? What are the questions? And uh, if you don't know what that is right now, you may have an epiphany in the future. And we see it as our goal as counselors to help you understand what that is. So I just can't uh, thank you enough. I feel like I'm in rare company this morning of many people on this webinar who feel the same way as I do, that this is a, this is a really substantive area that we want to know more about and do best, best we can with. And it's been a real pleasure to be with you. Jeff, I'm going to turn it back to you, and I wish everyone a wonderful weekend. Thanks very much, Steve. Uh, what a great presentation. I've uh, heard many of these, and again, I've just gone through this. Uh, it, it requires patience, organization, collaboration, a really good team, following a process. Um, you know, if there's any part of the team that's not working together, it slows everything down, and, um, you know, you have to... You know, always think that you're you know working to live up to your fiduciary responsibility that you're you know the person that you know entrusted you with um you know um you know gave to you and that that's always something that was you know near and dear to me and going through that process so uh really important information that i hope uh, everybody uh, gleaned from this so thank you so much uh, we do have a couple of questions and then i'll have just a couple of closing comments and then we'll wrap up on time. Um, so uh, now will be your time to get your final questions in. And the first question we have is, what is the average time between the date of death and complete estate liquidation? Well, thank you for that. That is an interesting question. Uh, when you say liquidation, I'm assuming that you mean uh, when the assets are distributed. So if that's what you meant, uh, the typical time in regular probate, and again, there are expedited methods of probate in some cases that are allowed, but typically it's nine months. So in nine months, the claim of creditors period has long been over. Uh, the assets are now accounted for. The court in probate says, okay, we've approved that accounting. And now the beneficiaries have 20, or the interested persons have 20 days to object, uh, to file exceptions it's called. But if no one does accept or have an objection, then the assets can be distributed. So I would say about nine months on that. On re, in revocable trust administration, 
what we normally see is a variation of periods. Remember that in a revocable trust, assets are technically distributable immediately upon someone's death because there's no probate if it's properly done. But what do we know that's the highest and best thing? Well, the highest and best thing may not be to distribute everything immediately, even though it could be, because we have final tax returns. We need to get valuations. We need to be transparent, especially if there's more than one beneficiary. So this could be nine months, it could be six months, it could be 18 months, it could be three months. In the case of someone who is a single beneficiary of a revocable trust, it could be instantaneous. That person has no, no one to account to, they only have to do the very basic things for the deceased person and they take the asset. So it's going to depend on its probate or non-probate and it's going to depend on in a revocable trust non-probate situation just how fast or slow the, revo the revocable trust fiduciary, the trust successor trustee wants to distribute the estate. Okay, thank you. Next question is from our friend Jack. Would it be possible to touch on the pros and cons of a life estate deed and any impact on the cost basis for heirs? Hello, Jack. Thank you for that question. And uh, hope you have a good weekend ahead. So a life estate deed is a deed where uh, the owner of a real piece of real estate reserves a life estate um, to themselves and then at their passing leaves the assets to remainder men, those people that would take that asset and there's no probate. So the life estate owner has a life estate in the property. Uh, if they have reserved the right to sell the property, they can sell it during their lifetime and move to Florida or whatever they want to do. But if they die with that life estate, it goes to the remainder men and it gets a step up in basis. So Jack, there is a step up in basis, uh, a cost basis adjustment at death, usually up, not a cost basis down usually. Uh, and that is definitely an advantage of a life estate deed no pro no probate and a cost basis adjustment at death okay looks like those are all of our questions for now any last ones get them in right now please appreciate that as far as our next presentations go want to make you aware of those next thursday october 5th we'll be talking about medicare which plan is best for you this is our webinar and follow-up to our Howard County Library presentation that we did in person about Medicare. We have many requests for a webinar about that subject, so we'll be doing that again on Thursday the 5th at 10.30. Uh, Monday the 9th at 7 p.m., we'll have an evening presentation about the essentials of estate planning and elder law with Steve. And then on Wednesday the 11th, we have a new topic that we offered at a continuing care retirement community that was very well received the critical need to update your estate planning at 10 o'clock on Wednesday the 11th with Steve. So that is uh, what's coming up in the next couple of weeks. And also our client events on November 4th at 8.30 um, Saturday at 10 Oaks Ballroom in Clarksville. We have a great crowd coming and we are so excited. We've been planning it for eight months and it's almost here. Um, but we are very, very excited and hope you can join us uh, we're going to be talking about asset protection, protecting your legacy and the ones you love. We have some great guest presenters, um, great food, live music, a lot of door prizes. Yours truly is going to be the MC for the event. So I'm looking forward to that. I think this is my eighth or ninth year doing it. So looking forward to it. It's going to be a lot of fun, um, nice, friendly environment, um, great education, and a lot more. So um, you've probably received an invitation if you're on this presentation. Um, if not, let me know if you want more information. I'll be happy to send it your way, and we look forward to seeing you there. So we'll see if we have any final questions. Looks like we don't, and I'll be sending out the recording, the materials again, the letter of wishes, and some other follow-up items for you uh, very soon. So we appreciate, as always, um, your interest in our Elvo webinar series and Elvo and Associates in general, and we'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Go Orioles. Have a great weekend. Thanks very much.